Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to give you uh, this uh, presentation uh, jointly with Daisy. Um, I have been a long-term user of, uh, of Gurobi um, and, um, and a, a big supporter. Uh, my group at MIT uses it uh, very extensively. So, um, so you heard the objective. I would like to tell you uh, the presentation is into three parts. First, I'll give you an introduction, then um, talk about uh, optimal trees, which is our answer for interpretable methods, a core product of interpretable AI, as the name suggests. Then another one on optimal feature selection in both these methods, we utilize uh, mixed integer optimization engines. And then Daisy will talk about some concrete applications in industry. Um, so what is interpretable AI? So Jack and Daisy were um, uh, two students of mine, PhD students and friends. And uh, we started the company two years ago with the idea of uh, building uh, technologies that provide um, cutting ed edge performance, but also delivering interpretability as well, which is not present today. So um, examples, as you have heard, is about imputing uh, missing data. Uh, this is came directly out of the DAISY's PhD thesis. Optimal decision trees came out of Jack's thesis. Feature selection came out of some of my research um, at MIT and interpretable matrix completion. The, there's ongoing, of course, work on multiple areas. We are both, um, we are trying to be current and uh, we hopefully innovative things in the, in the future. Um, so the key motivation of the company and the key motivation of the of what I'm about to tell you is the fact that uh, machine learning methods, um, artificial intelligence methods that have really affected society, deep learning is a good example, are by and large black box methods. Namely, you don't really know what is happening underneath. They offer often quite accurate predictions and uh, and they typically generate uh, reasonably accurate predictions, sometimes uh, state of the art, but they utilize a lot of parameters, sometimes uh, you know, millions or billions, with not really full understanding of what is going on. To give you a concrete example, so suppose um, you know, uh, a, an Uber driver in a self-driving mode is involved in, a, in, 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 involves, is involved in a fatal um, crash accident, which let's say a passenger loses their life. Um, do we know that the, the vision algorithm is correct? Uh, and most importantly, can society afford not to know the answer to this question? Uh, I would say that's an important question. And in many other areas, I, we have some examples about the Apple card um, because it might allow discrimination because we don't really understand what is underneath the hood. So it, it makes sense to us, and this was the premise of the company, to develop models that uh, leaders and decision makers can understand and then stand behind with some confidence. Um, and uh, our objective is, uh, of course, to achieve both the traditional interpretable methods like linear regression and decision trees do suffer in terms of performance. Um, they are good methods, but uh, compared to most uh, advanced methods like boosted trees, uh, random forest, uh, neural networks, they often suffer. They are not as strong in terms of performance, even though they are far more interpretable. The question is, can we improve the performance of interpretable models so there is no price to pay, or, or if, if there is a price, it is a small price. Another motivation aspect of, of our work is that uh, and I come, as some of you might know, I come from an optimization background, uh, or our optimization background. So many problems in machine learning statistics uh, can naturally be expressed as mixed integer optimization problems. However, and this is primarily, uh, these are beliefs formed in the 70s with the theory of NP completeness, that mixed integer optimization statistics is typically considered impractical and the corresponding problems intractable. So much so that uh, statistics departments around the country do not have uh, courses that their students can take in these areas, discrete optimization in particular. They do have um, convex optimization, for example. So as a result, because of this uh, belief that these things are impractical, heuristics are often used. The two famous ones is LASSO uh, for, for subset regression, um, work that um, Robert Tipsirani did in 96, uh, very widely 
um, viewed work. Um, and then CART by Leo Breiman and co-authors in from the mid 1980s for optimal classification. But both methods are not are high quality, but but uh, heuristic methods for the objective. At the same time, if you look at the progress, and this is something I have experienced in terms of as a user. So in the last, uh, and these numbers are only indicative, but if you look at the performance improvement from the early 90s, when CIPLEX was uh, started to today, um, the, the, and, and roughly half of the progress is due to software, uh, half of it is due to hardware. Uh, the speed up is an astonishing, uh, I, we estimated here 2.2 trillion times, it might be four now and so forth. But the key here is we are talking about significant orders of magnitude, 10 to the 12. Uh, so a mix in desert optimization problems that would have taken, let's say, 70,000 years to solve 25 years ago with the then software and then hardware, it can now be solved by a modern computer with today's codes in less than one second. That's an astonishing performance improvement. So the, the a reasonable research question is that given the dramatically increased power of optimization, um, is mixed in desert optimization able to solve key problems considered intractable, let's say a decade, decade ago, and how do they compete with state-of-the-art methods? So uh, this paradigm, you have heard um, from um, um, the, the, the lady who introduced us, a, a book that I wrote with Jack Dunn, the other the other partner of uh, co-founding partner of uh, interoperable AI, we just finished a book on machine learning under a modern optimization lens. This is an area that I have dedicated about 10 years of my research at, uh, at MIT that takes this paradigm and, uh, and basically reports our findings in the last uh, decade or so. So, um, and I will give you two examples. The first is SCART. So Leo Breiman, um, a hero of mine, um, uh, published a book with two or three other people in 1984, introduced CART, a heuristic approach for classification, widely spread in academia and industry of the order of uh, 50,000 citations, uh, quite an astonishing number. Uh, to demonstrate it, let me introduce a method for those of you who might not know. So these are data from um, 1936, uh, it, uh, the Irish data set. They represent, in this case, um, physical characteristics of flowers, the sepal length and the sepal width. Um, and there are two types of, of flowers in this case, the red, setosa is the scientific name, and the green, uh, virginica is the scientific name. So what does CAR do? Uh, heuristically, and a step at a time, um, creates partitions. The first partition is the one that uh, splits the data is as uniform in a, as uniform a way as possible. Um, illustrated here for a, with a vertical partition. On the right, you see all the points are mostly 100% classified. On the, on the left, there are some points that are less uh, classified. So you continue on the left, uh, you, demo, you cut again, or in this case, with a horizontal partition. And then all points that are in, the, in this part of the state space are, are uh, the red, setosa, and the other ones are viewed green because this is the, uh, the majority of the observation. So this can be represented by a tree. A tree is represented here, sepal length bigger or smaller than 575, and then sepal width smaller or less than 2.7 and corresponding classifications after that. Now, the key characteristic, of course, of this tree is that it is done uh, greedily and once a partition is made, when, uh, once a split is uh, decided, it stays constant. In other words, it, it's never um, done, it is, it is not revisited again. So the method is fundamentally greedy. Uh, however, it's very, it's exceptionally um, interpretable. It, it also simulates in a way the human mind. So it makes a series of locally, locally optimal decisions, but of course the, the final tree could be far from optimal. This is Leo Breiman's words in 1984 from the book I quoted. And he also quoted something else. He says, finally, this was in 1984. Finally, another problem frequently mentioned by others, not by us, is that the tree procedure is only one step optimal, but not overall optimal. If one could search 
all possible partitions, the two results might be quite different. We don't address the problem here. At this stage of computer technology, an overall optimal tree growing procedure does not appear feasible for any reasonably sized data set, which was uh, correct in 1984. So, um, in um, 2000, roughly when Jack uh, finished, started his PhD thesis, uh, about 2015, we started working on this and we published a paper in machine learning 2017 and then further improvements in our book in 2019, where we utilize mixed integer optimization and local search methods to consider the entire decision problem at once and find an optimal tree for both regression and classification. The algorithm scale to about a million um, points and maybe 10,000 variables um, and um, the what we have found is that um, the the method um, for classification is of the order of maybe three to five times slower than cards and if we allow in the partitions uh, hyperplanes namely uh, not horizontal and vertical partitions but absolutely you know how support vector machines work but uh, but for the entire space and recursively, not only one, only one, one shot, then uh, it, is, it is slower. Uh, but it's still doable for the size. The reason mixed integer optimization is an, it's an, it's a natural way to do it is because there are decisions like which variable to split on, which label to predict for a region, which and then outcomes, which region to a point ends up in, where a point is correctly classified. Uh, so it uh, is a natural language of uh, for expressing the problem this is what i was telling you about hyperplanes but it, in addition to um, considering vertical and horizontal partitions we also consider hyperplane partitions in which we split the data into polyhedral sets so a key question of course is whether um, what is the performance we maintain the, the regular optimal classification trees are, have exactly the same interpretability as cards. So, um, at least according to Leo Bryman, not exactly in, in, uh, uh, an unbiased observer, he says that uh, card uh, trees receive an A plus in terms of interpretability, and I agree. So, so the red, this is the performance, this is the depth of the tree, uh, the, and then this is the out of sample accuracy in 60 real world data sets ranging from small to sizable, 250,000 uh, versus a few thousand Ps, a few thousand factors. So the red is card, the blue is optimal classification trees, and the green is optimal classification trees with hyperplanes. And there are several observations. Um, the the delta in performance give, keeping interpretability exactly the same of optimal classification trees versus cart is of the order of depending on the on the depth between one and two percent maybe even more for lower depths and then uh, there's an additional uh, sometimes uh, three to five percent if you add hyperplanes with hyperplanes you do, you do penalize interpretability a little bit, but on the other hand, we have a version of the code that produces uh, sparse planes in which only a pre-specified number of variables are included in a cut. For example, cut one is a regular trees, cut two it only involves two, um, two factors. For example, you could say two times blood pressure plus three times um, temperature is less than 150, involving only two out of many. Um, uh, factors. So, uh, so there is a sizable improvement on performance uh, as a result. What is un unusually surprising to us anyway, definitely when I first saw it, uh, I did not, uh, I asked Jack, are you certain? Uh, so this is now a comparison with random forest and, um, and uh, boosted trees. So random forest is um, the curve indicated here, intermediate between the two, the blue and the red. And what you observe, a random forest for those who don't know, is uh, you, you split the data randomly and the factors randomly, you generate a tree. You keep it aside. You put the data back, you resample again. A new set of rows and columns, you do another tree, you do it a thousand times. And then when you have a new observation, you run it through a thousand trees and you take majority. That's a random forest. Boosted trees, is something cleverer in which you build the first tree and then you you see what mistakes it makes and you build the second tree that improves on the mistakes and then 
a third tree that improves of the mistakes of the second tree and so forth. And then you average. Clearly, the averaging helps in performance, as it is clear from the from the graphs. Uh, but it uh, destroys interpretability because what how are you going to summarize the results of a thousand trees? What is surprising in these graphs is that a single tree, the optimal classification trees, is uh, at least comparable. In fact, the results say on average better, uh, slightly better than random forest and uh, optimal classification trees with hyperplanes is uh, comparable, in fact, slightly better on average. I'm not saying on a specific problem. On a specific problem, one method can be uh, better than the other. But on average, it holds its own. So I would say this suggests that the advances in optimization um, and the advances of understanding uh, the scalability of optimization methods uh, has is capable of definitely decreasing and perhaps even eliminating the gap between uh, or the price of um, that sometimes we have to pay in terms of interpretability. So um, of course there are other variants of trees that we have uh, utilized. For example, I presented a classification trees. We have also optimal regression trees uh, that are treated extensively in the book we wrote with Jack. There is optimal survival trees that predict survival over time, particularly relevant in healthcare applications or financial applications. Um, this is a paper that we wrote with some of my students in Jack. And optimal prescriptive trees, um, which you don't only decide but uh, predictions, but you also decide decision, for example, which drug to give. To a, to a patient, uh, which uh, price to select in a pricing application, which, which product to offer to a, to a customer, and so forth. Um, and then we'll give some examples, uh, Daisy will give some examples of this. What I would then like to, to talk about is how we utilize index of optimization in the case of um, feature selection. So um, it is fair to say that linear models such as linear regression and logistic regression are one of the most easily understood and well studied models a friend of mine has told me that if you look at uh, which problems today's computers are more busy on they are regression models however when the number of features is high these methods suffer as they do not know how to select the best subset and in some cases selecting features is not a luxury, just only for interpretability purposes. It might be a necessity in what's called high dimensional statistics. A concrete example from my experience, I have worked with data from um, a large pharmaceutical company, a thousand patients that had various types of uh, adenocarcinoma, and then uh, the number of factors were the various genes in the cancer when, we, when you um, sequence, sequencing the gene of the cancer. So it's typically a thousand observations, a thousand patients, about 50,000 uh, columns, 50,000 factors. Clearly, any, any regression model will have zero error if you select all the factors. You have many degrees of freedom. So the only real, real way to go is sparsity. Lasso methods, where you do a, what's called an L1 regularization, uh, while they do find the truth, they also find many other additional factors, as you will see later in the presentation. So, which makes it not so so useful for actionable items, for example, how to design drugs that hit particular uh, particular genes. So, as a result, heuristics as lasso or elastic net um, solve the problem approximately, but none of them solve the exact um, what's called L0 problem. So, um, so the problem, as stated, is with some regularization, which is done for robustness purposes, this is from the field of robust optimization, which is another story, is to minimize the least squares plus a regularization term, what's called the um, Piconov regularization, subject to the fact that the support of beta, namely the number of non-zero betas, is less than k. For example, for the case of the problem I mentioned uh, with the pharmaceutical environment, it, you know, uh, the, the dimension is 50,000, but k should be 10 or 20. Okay. So then the, the approach we have taken, and this is a, a, a paper I, I wrote with uh, Bart Van Paris, uh, currently a colleague of mine at MIT, then a postdoc in my group, um, recently appeared in the Annals of Statistics this year. We rewrite. Uh, <coughs> The, the beta i, the variables, 
as beta i times si, where si is zero or one uh, variable, and let s be the diagonal of the matrix. So this is unusual, right? We we basically we have been teaching our students um, to model um, problems in a linear fashion, and now I'm saying we should really forget about that and and consider modeling with non-linearities, in fact, non-convexities. Products um, of beta times s is obviously not a convex function. So, but then I write in the following way: whenever I see beta, I uh, write s beta as a diagonal matrix, and beta i si si squared is equal to si because si is binary. So I can rewrite this problem exactly as minimizing s subject to the constraint that these are binary. Uh, uh, a binary vector and the sum of the s's is less than k, uh, I optimize over s outside and I optimize over beta inside. And notice that this is a quadratic function of beta. So I hope you, you can see that this problem here is equivalent to this problem here. Um, and the, this uh, nonlinearity trick allows you to separate s and, and beta but you now got rid of this uh, constraint. Now it's implicitly, it is in the in the set SK where the sum of the says is less than K. And notice that this formulation doesn't have big M's. Um, you can model this in an earlier paper we have written it as a big M formulation where we have beta I absolute value is less than some big M times SI, but here we don't. But now the crucial observation here is that this problem as far as beta is a quadratic function that you can solve in closed form. Um, the fact that you can solve in closed form is not so important. The fact is that you can calculate uh, the value function and derivatives is really important, but it's also closed form solvable. So it, it is minimizing a convex function subject to binary variables. And the reason this is convex is because the kj, the matrices that multiply the variables sj are positive definite, rank one positive definite matrices. So this is a convex function subject to binary constraints. And I, so this is an exact depiction of this problem, an equivalent formulation. So, um, so it's a binary convex optimization problem. And the way we solve it, we solve it with cutting plane methods. Namely, we start with an S0, right? We approximate the function, and by convexity, this is appropriate. We leave the function on the right. Uh, so we approximate the function as a piecewise linear convex function. And at each point in time, we minimize um, piecewise linear over binary variables, which can be done with today's solver quite well, using also the ability of lazy constraints that um, allow you to not reconstruct the, the branch and boundary every time. So the speed gains are significant. Moreover, we have found experimentally that the number of cuts given is very small that you need, especially for small k. If you have, say, k equals 30, you only have to in invert k by k matrices, uh, 30 by 30, not a difficult task, um, which makes the problem particularly tractable. So, um, so that's a, a particular depiction of the algorithm. You can study it when you get uh, our presentation in more detail. I, I would like to now spend some time here, which in my view uh, illustrates in the field of statistics and machine learning, the, the significant power of both the idea of using nonlinear formulations as well as the current, uh, the current uh, solvers. In this case, is Gurobi. So, uh, so this is an example, synthetic examples, in which you, you we utilized, um, uh, let's say, 10,000 variables, 10,000 points, 20,000 points, 100,000 points, and uh, the number of factors is 50,000, 100,000, 200,000. These are very significantly large problems that were in, you know, completely out of reach a few years ago. So this is the exact time to solve it to provable optimality. The algorithm I mentioned converges um, to, to in finite time, but this is the time in seconds to solve to provable optimality. And this is Lasso, in which the only difference is you instead of doing uh, the L0 norm, you add a regularizer, uh, the, the sum of the absolute values of the betas, the L1 norm. The, the, I find these results uh, quite interesting, namely that the integer optimization methods have running times that are lower, lower 
than the continuous optimization methods. And we are using here uh, a, a very fast implementation, uh, GLMLNet, that uh, people from Stanford have, uh, have programmed. The fact that it's faster is not so relevant. The fact that it is comparable, it is relevant. And the reason we cannot solve these problems is not speed, it is memory. You know, at the computers we have, putting in, mem in main memory 100,000 dense, 100,000 by 200,000 dense matrices is not, uh, is not an easy task. So you need more sophisticated architectures to be able to accommodate this. So in other words, this is a, a, a method that is it's tractable um, and uh, specifically it also suggests that uh, we really need to consider complexity again namely the traditional complexity theory the theory of mp hardness suggests that the difficulty of a problem increases with dimension however uh, sparse methods have the property that for a small number of samples I don't have, unfortunately, the, the, the particular slide for that. that but uh, for a small number of samples, this approach, uh, no other approach, it doesn't have enough signal. It takes a larger amount of time to solve the problem, but you, you cannot recover the truth because you don't have enough signal. But as the, as the signal increases, as you have higher N, as you can see, the speed becomes exceptionally high. And in addition, um, you also, we have also observed experimentally, and then uh, there has been theoretical results that prove it, but for a large number of samples, this approach, we call it the dual approach, uh, solves the problem extremely fast and recovers 100% of the support with no, with 0% um, false positives. For example, in the, in, the, in the example I gave you, with 1,000 by 50,000, a lasso type method uh, you will find, let's say, 140, 150 factors out of 50,000, which is still good. But our method found 10. And uh, the 10 were the subset. But if you are a pharmaceutical company and you would like to be um, interested in developing uh, targeted therapies, I mean, from 130 to, to 10, there are 120 that are really not relevant. Uh, as a result, you are wasting your time. You, interpretability is important, and finding the correct factors, not, not um, you know, fa false positives, is important as well. And this method has this characteristic that is capable of, uh, of doing exactly that. Of course, we have extended the sparsity ideas to classification problems, to matrix completion, with and with outside information, it's one of our core products as well, to tensor completion, which you have multiple dimensions, not only um, not only two. So matrix completion is the following important problem. Let's take uh, the problem of um, trying to understand um, you have people and you have products. And um, you have, let's say, millions of people and, uh, and millions of products. And you know historical purchases from person I of various products. Matrix completion is how do you complete the, the matrix um, so that you can make good recommendations by basically saying that the rank of this new matrix that you want to make it full is small, meaning that people select uh, products based on a few features, not in many. So this sparsity in matrices is the corresponding low rank. Other, other examples is sparse inverse covariance estimation, factor analysis, sparse PCA, and so forth. The theoretical aspects of these methods and the methods that lead to solving them are, are described in the book I mentioned on, um, on, uh, with Jack on uh, machine learning under modern optimization links. So many of these products, many of these methods are now part of the interpretable AI offerings, which um, with clients, what we have found, we adapt, of course, to the environment. Great, thank you. And many thanks to the organizers at Gorobi for having us today. Um, so first, before I go into the specific case studies, I just want to spend a couple of minutes to talk about some implementation details and how do we achieve the scalable implementation with Gorobi in integration to solve real world large problems. So our code base is written in Julia um, and we call Gorobi with jump and gorobi.jl. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, these packages provide a very 
natural language expression of the modeling um, when you just specify the constraints, the objectives, as if you were to write it um, like, you know, as a mathematical formula, very easy to use. And another benefit is that it, it has very little overhead in terms of, uh, you know, wrapping it as a model and passing data in and out of it, so that when we're actually working with very large problems, um, it, it doesn't create too many copies of the memory and it's very efficient use. Um, Julia is also incredibly easy, uh, incredibly fast in itself. Um, so we landed on using this as our core coding language. Um, we also provide access to our um, product with Python and R as well. So uh, from the user perspective, there is no, um, no difference in whether you want to use Julia or Python. Um, as we said earlier, um, I think Dimitris demonstrated some examples from optimal feature selection where we use this cutting plane approach uh, with a lot of callback. Um, and that is uh, exactly how we use Gorobi in most of the cases. And in particular, we use this new feature of Gorobi 9.0, where um, you can actually do this callback with compute server. So again, it helps with scaling the problems um, to larger ones uh, where you need a big compute server. And specifically among all of the modules that we offer uh, for both optimal feature selection and the matrix completion, uh, we use the MIP solver uh, with the uh, the cutting plane approach uh, and the, the matrix completion one is uh, um, currently under heavy development um, and we see very promising results that again it can be solved very fast and, and very scalable. Uh, and then the other type of problems, um, I think um, Dimitris just talked about the prescriptive approach. So a lot of the prescriptive problems uh, uh, for the optimization step, uh, we would need to use Gorobi solver, uh, both the mixed integer optimization part um, and also the convex solver uh, for that aspect. So it's very strongly kind of connected and knitting uh, between Gorobi and our software modules. All right. So um, as the next step, I just wanted to share some success stories where we deliver value with interpretability and performance through um, MIO approach. Because the interpretability um, is so useful in many areas, um, we have actually done a lot of work in a broad variety of industries. Um, so healthcare, as an example, it's very natural where interpretability is needed because doctors are making life or death decisions and they cannot operate if they don't actually know why the model is giving them certain prediction. And I'll give you an example on how we help predict surgical risk in just a second. In areas like finance or insurance, where there's very strong regulation for, uh, for the models to be transparent, to not be discriminatory. Uh, we've also done many cases where we show that, and I present a case on long uh, default risk prediction. Um, and other places like manufacturing, like retail or real estate, uh, where the key decision makers, um, especially you know, the, the higher ups at the companies who really need to understand the story from the data so that they can make a more, in, more informed decisions, they also have seen a lot of value coming from themselves being able to see the model. The fact that they're not data scientists themselves, but just being able to have the conversation with the data scientists uh, at the same level is hugely important. And we've done many cases in those areas as well. So you can see more details on our solutions page uh, on our website, uh, for where for each of the examples, we give you some more details on what specific technology among our module was being used to solve that problem. Um, so on that healthcare one, we have been collaborating with the top surgeons at the Massachusetts General Hospital to solve the problem of predicting the risk of uh, emergency surgery. And this is hugely important because for surgeons to make a decision on whether they should go ahead with a highly risky surgery, um, or for them to have that discussion with patient and the family, they need to know what is not only the risk of mortality and other complications, but maybe more importantly, what is driven? Um, what is the rationale behind that? Um, and that's a sort of the motivation for why we started building this product. Um, the top surgeons at Mass General Hospital have been using this uh, logistic regression-based tool, which is linear um, and it's not very accurate. And the most difficult part 
is that this tool is that you have to answer questions to uh, sorry answer um, 20 questions so you know in a time where every minute on their time is super valuable it's very difficult for them to have to always have this very lengthy interaction with the tool with that in mind, we use the optimal classification tree to revisit the problem and trying to see if we introduce this optimal nonlinearity in it, can we reduce the kind of you know, uh, size of the model and can we get better performance? And indeed we did. So this is an example of the tree that predicts any complication post-surgery, where it looks at whether there was transfusion, whether the patient is on ventilation, age, and some lab results. And quickly, just in a few questions, about four to eight on average, um, and the questions are dynamic. The doctor can immediately get to an accurate risk estimate for what's the patient's risk of uh, mortality or a specific complication. And what's the best part is that uh, it doesn't just simply give you this number. The whole thing about the interpretability is that now the doctor can go back into the specific sequence of answers to questions and to validate their, the reasoning, they can see, oh, I actually, I thought it was 10%. Why is it so much higher? Oh, it's because I missed this part about the patient currently being on mechanical ventilation. So together with the doctor, this app really supports their decision-making process to give them a much more data-driven and a much more um, um, evidence-based approach to their human kind of intuition-based decision-making. The model is also highly accurate. Um, I believe that we achieved about 5% extra um, AUC compared to the state of the art. Um, and because of the combination of the accuracy and the interpretability, now it's being used wide, broadly at the Massachusetts General Hospital, as well as uh, other leading research uh, hospitals in the United States and globally. Um, in addition to the surgical risk application, we have about 10 to 12 other applications in healthcare covering a broad range from oncology to child uh, health, head injury um, to cardiovascular risk. Um, and a lot of it, we get very similar feedback from the doctors where they really appreciate the ability for it to learn insight from data, where in the past it was a very kind of ad hoc process where they query the database and trying to see, um, you know, like to validate their, their intuition. Um, another example I want to share is in the area of finance, uh, where the key problem is to predict sort of a, the risk of a, a loan default. And this is important for interpretability because credit allocation, you need to be able to explain why you're making that decision um, to explain to both your customers um, and also the regulators so that you need to prove, so that you can prove that you're not discriminating uh, people of color or people of uh, a certain gender, for example. And for that reason, for that need of interpretability, this whole area of research of explainable AI came out, uh, which is um, somewhat useful in terms of uh, providing post hoc explanations on existing model. So here's an example where if you train a black box model, say XGBoost in this case, you can try to provide some kind of local interpretation uh, for a given person, say a young woman, um, you know, who had not had any credit history in the past, what are the features that are affecting that decision? And you can do the similar exercise for a different person with the local interpretation. But the issue is that they don't provide you with a global view. They don't tell you why that person falls into, you know, this region in the first place. It kind of gives you kind of a, a, a very local and a post hoc view um, to, to, to address the, some of the, the importance of the variable. And there's uh, some more sophisticated methods such as SHEP um, that gives you a more holistic understanding and evaluation of the model. And sometimes it evaluates the interactions between the variables um, and gives you a whole spectrum of uh, post hoc analysis that you can look at. And again, this is uh, helpful in a sense, um, but it's not directly what the, it, it's still not directly showing you the model. 
Um, and again, it, the, the type of output that come out of a shaft can be very complex and it requires another layer of human interpretation to interpret the model interpretation, right? So um, it, unless you're an expert uh, data scientist, again, it's very hard to draw any insight from shaft. In comparison, uh, we trained an optimal decision tree to directly predict the default risk. And because of the nice tree structure, you don't need to do any kind of postdoc processing. Any decision that's made is self-explanatory. Um, so we take this example where this person, we predict a bad loan uh, default risk. And you can see immediately by following the path that it's because of the value for external risk estimates is within a certain range um, and based on the percentage of uh, trades that was never delinquent and some other features that we tell it exactly uh, why it is predicted to be bad. So you know what matters, you know what doesn't matter, you know what's the interaction of the variables. Um, there's no guessing or no kind of a postdoc processing going on. And we find this to be highly valuable when we present it with the financial institutions that do care about explaining the model fairly to regulators. Another example I want to cover is uh, in terms of uh, manufacturing test design. So typically in these automotive testing, you need to generate some hypothesis and figure out which variables or combination of variables could affect your outcome and then make your design based on that result. The issue is you don't want to have too many variables in your hypothesis. You don't want to end up with a hundred of them and then start kind of dicing and slicing the data and ended up generating thousands of little experiments to run. And this is where optimal feature selection really come in and add value. So compared to the elastic net or a variation of lasso where it uses a greedy method to find the best subset of features, um, you see that it takes about 80 or so feature for this elastic net method to uh, achieve its peak performance. Uh, whereas with optimal feature selection, very quickly with simply eight features, it achieves the same level of, of performance. So it becomes very efficient in terms of choosing and telling the user what features are most useful for them to keep exploring and running the experiment with. It also adds a lot more to the interpretability. Imagine if you present a model with over hundreds of features and say these are all important and here are the coefficients. It's very hard to get that immediate kind of expert feedback for um, their understanding and their criticism on what they think the model is doing compared to one where you're only presenting them with eight features. Um, so we have found a lot of uh, success in terms of using optimal feature selection in areas uh, where there are tons of, uh, as Demetrius was mentioning, in healthcare, in manufacturing, where there's tons of potential signals out there. Uh, so to summarize kind of the points that we've made, um, I hope we've convinced you that interpretability is important in real world applications. Um, accuracy is obviously important, but for these uh, applications to actually be deployed with confidence uh, for people who are not machine learning experts to really trust the model, you need the models to be transparent and interpretable. And to achieve that both interpretability and accuracy, we learned that mixed integer optimization solutions does provide an edge. And we saw in those two examples, both for optimal trees and optimal feature selection, by a combination of a good and smart model formulation and using a good solver like Garobi, you can really scale it to practical problems of the size in the hundreds of thousands so that you're no longer limited by you know, just solving toy problems. You can actually deploy it at industrial level settings um, with provable optimality. So finally, uh, with those uh, case studies that I presented, um, I just wanted to show that these interpretable methods do have a lot of uh, useful applications in various uh, areas um, of industry, things like in healthcare, computer security, finance, 
um, and manufacturing, almost all areas, even the ones that are not naturally where you think interpretability is needed, like the manufacturing example. But through working through this collaboration that we have with the key experts um, and the decision makers, we've seen that interpretability does deliver value. Um, so uh, just a quick note, um, we offer um, free academic license and also evaluation licenses. So if you're interested after this uh, talk, you can always contact us directly. And thank you, Professor Butzimers, Daisy Zhu and Kostya for this great presentation. Thanks again, and we'll see you in our next webinar. Take care. Bye.